Welcome to the second part of our video series on the SAIC Model Federation process for the SAIC Validation Suite 2.0 release. In this video, we'll be focusing on the top half of the Model Federation process as it is described in the SAIC DE Model Federation process model in the activity diagram in the Key Views package. Before we go into the steps, let's talk about the legends. The shading of the steps indicates which model or tool the step should be performed in. The different models and tools are described in detail in the block descriptions table also located in the key views package, but we'll do a brief overview here to aid an understanding of the steps. A federated model in the SAIC model federation process describes a model which contains the content that we want to federate. So for example, in a system of systems federation, a peer model would be a system. In other examples, you might have separate subsystems model that you are federating into a system model. These peer models in our examples, which we're, we are providing, are the smart hub, the smart TV, and the smart stove in our system of systems. A library is a model that contains a set of model elements which are shared amongst all of the different models that are in the federation and aids in the model federation process. The federation model is the top level model in our federation which contains content from all of our federated models. In our example, that is a system of systems model that describes how our various smart systems interact with each other. Profiles in this case include the SAIC profile and the SysML profile, but can include any other profiles that you want to use in your project. Some of our activities do occur directly in Teamwork Cloud or include cross uh, model management activities that don't happen in any one individual model. And finally, we introduce the concept of a micro model. This is a model that is created uh, specifically when a peer model, for some reason, cannot be included directly in the federation model. We'll go over the circumstances under which that occurs and the contents of the micro model when we get to those steps in more detail. In addition, icons that are attached to the different activities indicate who is responsible for performing a particular step in the process. Peer model owners are those that own the federated models themselves. They have authority over that content. The model federation owner is the person who owns the federation model and is responsible for the over, overall model federation effort. And our model manager has permissions on Teamwork Cloud to set up user groups and conduct various types of activities that don't occur in any individual model, but they have higher level permissions such as administrator privileges. For this process, details on any of the specific steps are provided in the process steps descriptions table anchored on this diagram and also located in the key views package. We begin by setting our environment access permissions. This sounds pretty simple, but in model federation, this can actually be quite complicated to determine governance and who is allowed to see what. It's really important that everybody can see the library and can see any profiles that are going to be directly used and distributed through the library. But permissions to the different peer models and the federation model can vary widely depending on your usage. Once we have our group permissions and accesses all set up correctly, we can start adding uh, models to the Teamwork cloud with the correct access permissions. We're going to be creating initially four different types of models, the peer models themselves, the library, uh, the profiles, which could be reused or created, and our federation model. Once each of those are in place and the access permissions are correct on all of them, we can start adding usages. In particular, we're going to be going from the bottom up. So we start with our profiles and we start adding them, any of those that we want to directly share with everybody into the library. If there, are, if there are profiles that are necessary to model federation, but are not necessary to everybody, those can be added directly to the federation model. And likewise, any that are specific to a given peer model, but are not necessary to share with everybody can be added directly to the peer model. Uh, do keep in mind that peer models that are going to be directly used, which we'll go over in a moment, in the federation model, any profiles that are loaded, loaded in that will be exposed to the federation model as well. After we have our direct profile usages in place, we need to make a key decision. 
for each individual peer model, is it appropriate for direct usage in the federation model? A model which can be directly used in the federation model has to have several, several characteristics. First of all, it needs to be in the same style as the federation model. If the style, styles are incompatible, then model validation will not work. Second, all of the content has to be appropriate for exposure in the federation model. Do keep in mind that when we're talking about whether a peer model is appropriate for direct usage in the federation model, exposing it to federation model will not necessarily expose it to the other peers who are developing content in the federation. That depends on the peer model uh, permissions. But in some cases, uh, many of the peers might have direct access to the federation model, in which case you could have peer-to-peer -peer exposure. So, for example, if our smart hub developer doesn't want to share some of its internal model information with the smart TV and smart stove developers, um, but they don't care if it's all exposed in the federation model, then it might be appropriate for direct usage. However, if the people who are developing the federation model should not have access to all of Smart Hub's data, then it is not appropriate for direct usage. Other content might become problematic when we're talking about whether a peer model is appropriate for direct usage in the federation model as well. Uh, for example, some models have a lot of reference models directly included in them that kind of explode the size of the model. They might have problematic profiles uh, loaded in them. For example, if you're developing a SysML federation model and you load a model that has UPDM profile in it, it tends to do weird things with how connectors work that require sometimes a, a significant amount of fixing in the background. And so you might want to consider what the profiles in the peer model and other loaded information, not just the peer model's content itself, what impact those might have on the federation model. Our ideal is that every peer model in our federation is appropriate for direct usage. This is the simplest method that has the lowest overhead. So in this ideal, all of our models are in the same style. The content is appropriate to be exposed in that federation model. We don't have any IP um, or other distribution you know, concerns for that. And, and the peer model itself is a good actor. It's, it's well constructed and it doesn't have any performance problems that would bleed up into our federation model. If that is true, then our next step is to add the library as a usage to the peer model and then add that peer model as a usage to the federation model. If we are not in that scenario for any reason, then we are in what we call the micro model scenario. Our peer model for some reason either has to have information alighted from the federation model or uh, it's not in a compatible style, in which case the peer model owner needs to create what we call a micro model, which is a very lightweight model that includes information, only that information which is needed to share in the federation model in order for federation to be successful. Uh, in this case, the library is not added to the peer model. Uh, the peer model uh, has the, um, the micro model added to it, but, and the library is added to the micro model. So we create the micro model, we add library to micro model, and then we add micro model to peer model. And then once all of that structure is in place, once we have kind of our micro model sitting off to the side of the uh, peer model, we can then add the micro model as a direct usage in the federation model instead of the peer model. Um, and we'll iterate through this process until all of our peer models, whether directly or indirectly, are added to our environment and uh, the correct usage patterns are set up. As each one is set up, we can start adding content, but we'll go more into content into the next video. Let's look at a couple of illustrations of what this process creates for you. Um, first, we're going to talk about two different scenarios. One where at least one peer model was uh, appropriate for direct usage in the federated model, and one where all of our peer models required a micro model. This IBD illustrates the usage pattern. Uh, in this case, we started with uh, one or more profiles that are added to the library. Again, one of these for our example is going to be the, uh, the SAIC uh, validation profile. Uh, 
we did not illustrate, but again, profiles could be, could have been directly added to the Federation model and to any of the peer models that required them directly. Then the library has been added to each peer model that is going to be directly used in the Federation model and to every micro model. Note that my peer model, which is unusable directly in my Federation model for whatever reason, does not have any usage pattern to the Federation model. Instead, it has a usage to micro model, which has the usage to library. So you can see that my unusable peer model does have access to library for some assets that it might want to use in any of the profiles that are in micro model, including the validation suite as it exists. Uh, and it also has access to the micro model that it is paired with here. Uh, the micro model and the peer model are both directly used in the federation model and their contents, um, including library and profile, are going to be flowed up here. That will create some redundant um, usages of library and of profile, but it's much better than other patterns, including the one that I'm going to warn you very strongly not to use, which is a cross mount between um, any two peer models. Uh, the issue that we see happening often is that usually peers um, in a system of system or in some sort of a federated model uh, will have at least some interfaces with each other. So in our example, you know, our, our smart TV and our smart stove are both going to interface with our smart hub. So in the smart TV model, they're going to want to show how they interface with smart hub and smart hub is in their model is going to show how they want to interface with smart TV. Obviously, we want those interfaces to be the same. And so uh, a strategy that some people use is they cross mount, they would cross mount the smart hub with the, with the peer. Basically, um, smart TV would have a usage of smart hub and smart hub would have a usage of TV. Uh, those, that creates a cyclical usage pattern that uh, basically creates really problematic performance problems. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't ever do that in our model federation strategy. Um, instead, both of those models have access through library, um, and they would have that whether they are an unusable peer or a peer through this model federation process. And there's going to be a surrogate in library that they are going to use to uh, build those interfaces. We'll go into detail about how that works in the next video in the series. Uh, the important thing to understand here is that there is no need to add direct usages between peers. Peers understand each other through library. So this tree structure uh, creates no cyclical usage patterns. It works from bottom up, from profile to library, to either peer or micro model, to the federation model. Um, and any uh, models that for some reason cannot be used in the federation model are held off to the side with no direct usages. Let's take a look at uh, the example where none of our peer models can be directly used in our federation model. So this diagram illustrates that scenario. And here you can see that the only models that federation model includes are micro models. You can, in fact, create a federation of micro models. This can be uh, a very common kind of scenario if, for example, you are in a integrator role um, or you know, a government role on a program where you had no control over how the individual peer models were developed, but now you want a next higher level view of how all of these things interact with each other. And you also want to validate whether the way each of these models, which were essentially developed as stovepipes, um, you know, represent their common interfaces. So you can do that using the micro model pattern. Um, in this case, we have profile to library to one or more micro models to the federation model. And all of our peer models are sitting off to the side with no direct usages to the federation model, but with access to library in order to access common assets, um, and well as access to their own micro model to validate the content of that. So now that we've seen the process and the uh, illustrations of what the usage pattern should look like, let's uh, look into our included example models and uh, what kind of usages they have in them. So uh, any of our individual peer models, I'll use the smart stove as our first example here, if we look into its project usages, 
uh, its main usage is the Federation Library, and it actually has an indirect usage of the SAIC DE profile, which it's getting from the Federation Library. And that is all that it needs. Note that it can't see um, directly into uh, Smart TV or Smart Hub. Um, so any proprietary information that um, those developers wouldn't want to expose to our smart stove developer is protected. The same thing would be true uh, when we go into our uh, smart TV example. Um, but we, we did include in our example here one problematic uh, model. Our, our smart hub model is not built um, in a style that is consistent with how our integration wants to happen. And perhaps it has some content in it that we want to hide. Um, so in our project usages, um, we still get access to the library and indirectly we get access to the profile from the library. Um, but you notice we have an additional usage pattern here and that is its micro model. Um, and this will allow us in the follow on steps to do validation of our micro model against our model. Uh, so there's an additional usage if you are a model that is considered unusable in a federation and that is to add the micro model to your model. And finally, let's look at our system of systems model. And here you can see that I have directly used my smart TV, my smart stove, and my smart hub micro model. Note that the smart hub regular model is not anywhere in my usage tree here. I also have indirect access to the library and to the SAIC DE profile actually from all three um, of these models. Note that um, when I am at this level, the version of profile and the version of library that I have, and this is just the way that Teamwork Cloud works, is going to be um, the earliest version that any of these three models have in it. So updating models is going to be really important to the strategy, and we're going to talk more about that when we get to validation and to content development. Before we close it out, I will just share one more view back in our federation process. Just to illustrate once again that top level model, which in our example is the system of systems model, um, you notice had a direct access to the micro model and to our two good peer models and library and profile, but it did not have any access again to our unusable uh, peer model, which was the smart hub. Um, but it did have access to information about Smart Hub through its micro model. We'll continue on into the next video uh, describing how we add content and how we apply validation, which is really the key to how all of this works. Thank you.